You once said that uh, you like to make an audience scream through technical means. What is it about an audience screaming that you like? How many times have you heard a woman say, oh, I went to see the movie and had a good cry? <laughs> That's true. And they do, you see. Now, what is a good cry? She never says, I went there and had a bad cry. <laughs> Otherwise, she wouldn't have paid the money to go in the first place. So these people have paid money to be uh, scared just as much as they go to Disneyland and go on the big dip or whatever they call that railway, you know. The roller coaster? Although, yes, roller coaster, or the haunted house. They pay to be scared. Do you like to be scared yourself? No, I'm not keen about it. I have been on odd occasions. <laughs> like when? Oh, I think um, I was driving with my wife to Dubrovnik in the middle of the night, and we were on a ledge, on a mountain ledge, 8,000 feet up, and we came head to head on with a bus. So it was a question, who was going to go by first? And I remember having to get out and beckon her on, and the wheel was within 18 inches of the drop. I said, this may be good enough for the movies, but it's not good enough for me now. <laughs> I know that you plot out very carefully your scenario and, and work out mm. very carefully your films. Does it ever happen then that the actors get in the way of this, that you have trouble with them? Method actors do. You do? Well, method actors are like um, are children. They're all right for the theater. But their little problem with films, especially where cutting is involved. If you remember a film I made years ago called Rear Window, which was all from the point of view of one man, James Stewart, sitting in a window. Well, he had to look. Then I had to cut to what he saw, then cut back to his reaction. Now, what I was really doing was showing a mental process of the man by means of pictures, by what he saw. And um, supposing he said, well, I don't feel I would look that way. Well, how can the film be constructed on those lines? If he, I had it with that actor, um, who's now dead, called Montgomery Clift. He was a method actor. And you had difficulty with him? Well, uh, yes, I was shooting a scene in um, Quebec, and he was uh, playing the part of a priest who'd just been acquitted of a murder, but was being sort of booed and, and stoned outside the courthouse. And then the action of the film was to go across the street into the Chateau Frontenac Hotel which you've seen pictures of, so we'll probably be in there. Well, I wanted him to look up to the crowd and up to the people leaning out of the window. But I also had put on the facade of the building the big gold letters of the word hotel. So the audience would know where they were going into a hotel. And he said, I, I don't think I would look up. I said, well, you better look up or else. What about somebody like Orson Welles or uh, Charles Lawton? Well, Charlie Lawton was a problem. You know, um, when I made that film Jamaica in, it took a whole morning to get one close up. He was a nice man, a charming man, he really was. But oh, he suffered so much because, you know, he, he felt he couldn't get it out. And we were a whole morning on the one close up until he got up and he was crying in the corner. And I went over, sort of patted him on the shoulder. He looked up at me and said, aren't you and I a couple of babies? And I wanted to say, me? I mean, I, I wanted to use a gold witness and say, include me out, you know. So finally he came back and did it, you see. He said, all right. I said, yes, Charles, fine. It wasn't all that different from mm -hmm. the other close-ups, you see. And then he took me aside and put his arm around my shoulder and said, you know how I got it, don't you? I said, no, Charles. How? He said, I thought of myself as a small boy of ten wetting my knickers. Oh, really? <laughs>
absolutely true, really. You'd be astonished. Do you think there's something like a Hitchcockian actor, if that's a word, the, a type that is perfect for your films? Uh, I don't really think so. There are many, many types in the film Frenzy. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of leading people from the London theatre. Mm -hmm. I used to say years ago, I don't today because he's gone, Charles has gone, but I used to say the hardest things to photograph are dogs, babies, motorboats and Charlie Law. <laughs> motorboats because they never come back for take two. <laughs> and everybody's gesticulating and so forth. And, and they the never boat's calmly going on out to sea somewhere. You've used though a series of I guess what could be described as cool blondes, uh, Grace well, that, Kelly, Tim yes. Hedren, Madeline <coughs> That wasn't really by design. It was really to avoid the obvious, voluptuous, uh, sexy blonde. Speaking of sexiness, you deal a lot with uh, sexual aberrations and fetishes as subject matter. You feel this is a good subject matter for suspense? Well, suspense is, it doesn't relate really to that. Then why would you suspense use these? Suspense relates entirely to causing an audience to go through emotions and, and can only be arrived at by giving them knowledge. Most people get confused between the mystery story and the thriller and the suspense story. And the whodunit. See, well, the whodunit, the oh, it's a bit different. The whodunit, you see, is a uh, intellectual exercise, like a crossword puzzle. When you mm -hmm. buy a whodunit, you're terribly tempted to look at that last page, <laughs> and you don't because you feel you've wasted your money or be disappointed. But the suspense story is giving the audience full information before you start. In other words, there is a bomb under these seats. Tell the audience mm -hmm. that, and they will scream out and say, get out of there, get out of there. How about in Notorious? Could you uh, describe the build-up of suspense there? Well, the sus no, no, that wasn't really... The suspense there was, how soon will Claude Rains find out that the woman who was the daughter of an old friend it's an American agent. We all know it. Mm -hmm. We were told at the beginning that she was working with Cary Grant. Then you had the added fact that Cary Grant was in love with her. And yet in the course of his job, he literally had to put this woman into the arms of another man. Now that was your emotional story, but your suspense story, uh, which built up to its climax, when they just then, in the process of which, you come to the moment when it says, Mother, I'm married to an American agent. Now they know they've got to get rid of her. But they've got to get rid of her surreptitiously. Can't just bump her off, because all the rest of the, his colleagues will know. So you get a case of arsenical poisoning, you see. Who is your idea of an ideal villain? I've heard you read somewhere that you thought the Claude Rains kind of personified well, he was a nice deal. man in his way, you know. I think any, any man, uh, uh, as you know, uh, as you've seen the film Frenzy, mm -hmm. you've got a cheerful, lively man who is a, is a psychotic. You see, unless they're pleasant and, and acceptable, their victims would never go near them. Most people misunderstand what a villain is. He's a charming man who kills women. <laughs> but well, if he didn't have the charm, they'd run a mile from him. <laughs> well, that brings us back maybe to sexual aberrations again. Uh, you, there seem to be a lot of Jack the Ripper uh, types in various of your in various films. Well, they're only, they are aberrations uh, for the, by the fact that um, outwardly they're uh, acceptable members of society. And in the picture frenzy, I get to go to some extent in a scene between a doctor and a lawyer to explain that fact that outwardly they're normal, uh, apparently decent human beings. And then, quote, it comes over them, unquote. 
You do use humor. Uh, do you think that that plays a kind of relief from the building up of suspense? You'll always need it. You know, you can't it's like just a bomb keep... situation. If you have the bomb, you must never let it go off because mm -hmm. if you create a suspense with the audience, then you must relieve it. For instance, I think in the 39 steps when Madeline Carroll is in the train compartment mm -hmm. and she uh, gives the hero away after you feel she's not going to. Oh, well, that's true. Wouldn't, and wouldn't you if a man <laughs> burst into the apartment? In the movies, of course, she'd uh, return the embrace, you see. Mm -hmm. But then I don't believe what they do in movies. It's always correct. I'm a believer in you. Humor. I mean, who wants to uh, fill a film always with, uh, you know, heavy going? It's like the poor housewife, you know, and uh, those pictures that I that the heavy-handed I call them sink to sink pictures, because here's the poor housewife washing dishes at the sink. The husband returns from work, looks at this slightly forlorn figure and says, uh, look dear, why don't you dry your hands, go up and put on a cl nice clean dress, yeah, we'll get a sitter and we'll go out and have dinner and take in the movie. And she said, that'll be wonderful. Takes her apron off, goes upstairs, they get the babysitter, they go out, they have dinner, he parks the car, they go in the movie and she sits and looks at the screen and what does she see? A woman washing dishes at the sink. <laughs> yeah, they make those movies, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sink symbolizes the kind of uh, heavy-handed movie that's made. Sometimes I made them myself under certain circumstances, but uh, who wants to? What about in North by Northwest? That also well, that's a fantasy, of... you know. And what about the humor that's in North by Northwest? Can you describe a little bit the, the various things that you use well, there? Well, I mean, there's the humor of... Uh, Cary Grant being made drunk and goes on a wild ride in a car, you know. And there's a certain amount of wit on the part of he and the girl, so forth. Let's get back to suspense again. Can you describe a little bit the build-up of suspense in uh, Spellbound? Well, in Spellbound, you start, of course, with a mysterious figure. A Spellbound was based on a novel which we didn't use. It was called The House of Dr. Edwards. And it was the story of a doctor taking a patient to a mental institution. And although I never used it in the film, I wanted one of the men in the dining car of the train, and he saw a fly crawling across to take the fly and put the wings off. And the other man said, oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you, you know. And the point was, I didn't know which was the crazy man <laughs> who pulled the wings off, the doctor or the, uh, the patient. And we abandoned that idea, and I worked with uh, Ben Hecht on it, and we started the story of the new doctor who came into the institution and uh, fell in love with a female doctor and gradually uh, uh, he began to have sort of weird reactions to lines whether they were made by a fork on a tablecloth or the lines on the robe of the woman he'd fallen in love with but gradually, of course, it, it in a way was a mystery, but um, it was a mystery with certain overtones of psychiatry in it, you see. And it was almost like examining a, a, a patient under psychiatric, in psychiatric terms that the mystery was solved. It was really a mystery story, but of course a, a fresh approach to it. What about Strangers in the Train? The cutting back and forth between the, the lighter that's lost. Ah, well that was when he threatens. He threatens eventually because the nice man won't carry out his part 
of the so-called bargain, because a bargain was never made. Uh, he was a te the hero was a tennis player, so that the um, the villain, uh, the weird guy, uh, was on the way to um, a, the scene of the crime and was going to plant a piece of evidence which would make the hero definitely the murderer of his wife. And the, but unfortunately, the hero was occupied with a tennis match. And I always remember when we shot the long shots at Forest Hills, mm -hmm. and uh, they, were, they were Davis Cup matches. And I said, would you mind having that thing removed, please? It's in the way, <laughs> the Davis Cup. <laughs> so they took it away for me, and then we did this whole tennis match. And of course, the moment the match was over, he dashed after the other man. Through the years, you've achieved a great deal of fame and success. Do you like your fame? Does it give you a certain amount of pride? Well, it enables me to sleep at night. <laughs> You're making a joke of the question, but... No, I'm not making a joke. Does it, I, I mean... Know, really. Hard question to answer, because... I uh, mean, does it ever make you feel happy or proud to arrive at an airport and have cameramen and reporters and people there to greet it, you? Uh, some little things like that are nice. I remember once arriving at Tel Aviv and coming down the steps and having the whole airport applaud. <laughs> well, that was very nice. And once I was standing in the middle of the square at Copenhagen and um, there's a it's a very large square and the roadway there's an intersection and suddenly I heard the sound of an ambulance siren screaming it came from the far corner of the square I was just standing there no camera or anything uh, with an assistant and suddenly this ambulance stops at the intersection a man jumped out came rushing toward me said autograph please I gave him the autograph, he rushed back to the ambulance, they started the siren and he went on his way. <laughs> Who was it? That's what I don't know. I don't <laughs> even know whether the autograph was for the patient or the driver. <laughs> Mr. Hitchcock, before we get on to serious business, I'd like first of all to sort of very personally thank you for 40 years for me of marvelous movie going. It's been a great pleasure seeing them and meeting you today. Uh, most of the interviews I've seen and read with you have tended, I think, perhaps understandably, to constantly on the bigger films, the later films, the Spellbound, the Rear Windows, and so on. And today, with your permission, I'd like to um, initially at least go back to the beginning and discuss some of the earlier films which may not be quite so familiar today, uh, particularly since you worked in the German silent film, yes. to ask you how much your um, uh, early English films, particularly films like Number 17, really, you know, really drew on the uh, pictorial style that you may have picked up in the German cinemas and German studios. Well, in those days, this would be about 1924, when the Ufa studios were at their um, zenith almost, mm -hmm. they, they emerged from a company called Dekla Bioskop. And in those days, I, was, uh, I used to write the script and then become the art director. And I wasn't directing then, but I went to work at uh, Neubabelsberg, and of course, they were making some of the most famous films, the German films, the Nibelungen and uh, Jannings, The Last Laugh. Jannings was a tremendously important figure, uh, as was Murnau, mm -hmm. the director, Lang, Lubitsch, in those days. And um, I remember when I was working there, our picture was called The Blackguard, but uh, they were making The Last Laugh. And in those days, it's just the opposite to what happens today. Everything was done on the lot. And it didn't matter what the set was, they'd build it. And I remember in the last laugh, uh, Jannings, it's a, it was a story about the reverence that the Germans have for the uniform. Mm. And it's the only film ever made that told the story purely pictorially, without titles, without a word, of course it was, silent films in those days anyway. And they even built a hotel with the lobby and all the streets outside, with all the traffic and everything. And they even built a railroad uh, 
station with the great big glass roof and the locomotive and the passengers moving backwards and forwards. And they were, to me, prodigious jobs of production. Yes. Of course, the late British silence and the early British talkers were pretty much dominated by borrowed German talent, cameramen, directors, and so on. And um, I think a film like Your Own Number 17 is very, very uh, German in its yeah. pictorial style. Do you remember that film? Yes, but more than that, I think The Lodger, which was the third film. The first two films I made as a director were made in Munich, and I had to mm -hmm. direct them in German. But of course, they were English stories played with German actors, character yes. people, but it made no difference because there was no sound, mm -hmm. just titles. When I got back to England to do number three film, it was Mrs. Bellock Lowndes' famous book, The Lodger. And this is the story of a rooming house in London where one she wondered and the rest of the family wondered whether the man upstairs is Jack the Ripper or not. At uh, one of your other early British films lately, the 1934 Man Who Knew Too Much, which I, I love because of the way it gets into the, the, into the basic plot and the, the initial murders are very quickly and so very simply. You seem a little unhappy with the film. You refer to it as the work of a talented amateur, whereas your later film you consider that of a professional. I'm just wondering where you put the distinction, where you feel you stopped being an amateur and became that professional. I think, uh, I think actually the, the difference would be that in the original Man Who Knew Too Much, I wasn't audience conscious. Whereas in the second one, I was. Mm -hmm. no. But I must admit, many of us still, still feel that those um, early British films are by no means the work of an amateur, but we represent in some no, ways some of well, your best work. Uh, the best thing, and I can't remember to this day, I think it was to involve the father more. You see, having had Stuart in the role, you had to change your story, because in the original, Leslie Banks, the English actor, was in the lead, and he was caught and spent the end of the film locked up in a room. Mm -hmm. Well, you couldn't do that with a man of the stature of James Stewart. So your story had to be man manipulated to give him more activity in the latter part. Yes. And in such a way, I lost the original uh, uh, story's climax, which was the famous Sydney Street Siege. Mm -hmm which was a time about 1910 when three anarchists held up the whole of the British police force, the soldiers from the Tower of London, and just three of them. That's when Churchill went down, and you, there are photographs of him directing yes. operations from a doorway. Mm -hmm. And these men held everyone up, and they were, they were about to send to the nearest arsenal at Woolwich for the artillery to come out. It was, uh, when I went to um, Scotland Yard researching for the second version, a rather officious public relations man answered me with an, in an extremely peremptory way. I said, well, how would you handle the Sydney Street seats today? Oh, he said, we just sent two men in with a dog. Well, they I wouldn't have anarchists today anyway in England. Well, they have a different kind <laughs> of anarchists. Um, one other point I wanted to get into was the technique you've um, developed and uh, I'd say exploited through the years of sort of reaching past your actors and literally directing the audience so that you get the emotions you want, not by the players on screen, but by the, uh, you know, by the people sitting in the audience. That's which of course right. is, the, which is what, what any good director should do, but of course you've made rather a, a specialty of it. Well, the audience, that's what it's all about. Yes, but when did, when did you sort of become conscious of the fact that this was the way you would uh, really specialize I in directing? I think uh, during my American period, I was, became very conscious of audience. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Although there are hints in the beginning, because the, 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 the close of example <coughs> of the glass of, of drugged uh, wine in The Lady Vanishes is a very good example of directing the audience to that and not to the players. That is true. Well, you see, that comes under the heading of avoiding the cliché. You see, it, the, the poisoned wine situation, or the drugged wine, the, the character usually picks it up and goes like that and says, oh, by the way, and you said this, and, and he does this about a half a dozen times, which is such a cliché. So I decided 
to avoid that cliché and merely leave the wine there untouched until the last minute. Mm -hmm. But in order to keep the audience reminded of it, I photographed the scene, part of the scene, through the two glasses. So that will keep the audience yes. there. Well, when are they going to pick up the drugged wine? Um, I've heard you say in the past that, which is surprising for a director who makes so many thrillers and uh, suspense films, that you don't basically like the device of the chase as part of, as part of your films. Is that because you are sort of um, limited to being on location, that you can't pre-plan that on the storyboard? No, I, I think the chase is very good. Um, but um, I've never gone in for a purely physical chase. I know it's very effective, and you see you've had it in many, many films. I think what I, where I've changed is the chase to rescue someone that I've never cross cut. You see, in the early Griffith days, you know, they, he used to cross cut with a man either going to the gallows or the guillotine with the rescuer on the way. Well, I've tended to avoid that kind of cross cutting in a chase sequence and stayed either with one or the other which makes the audience sweat the yes. more because you don't show the progress of the rescuer. Now, in The Birds, I did that once or twice. I had a girl seated in front of a schoolhouse smoking, and uh, when she sits down, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a child's play thing, I forget, Jungle Gym, yeah. they call it. And there was one bird on it, you see. And I just put the camera on her and never showed what was going on behind her until eventually she follows one bird through the sky. When she turns around, there's a mass of them. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, in the old technique, you would have cross-cut with the girl, say, little does she know it, but the birds are gathering outside. But when she saw them, she tiptoed into the school, took the teacher to the window and indicated them. Never showed them. Mm -hmm. Then... The teacher turned to the children and said, now you all go home, go down the street quietly. When I tell you to run, you run. From that moment, the children are herded toward the door of the school house, and I went straight to the birds and stayed with them and never moved them until suddenly you hear the patter of the feet and all the birds went up. Mm. And somebody said to me afterwards, what happened to that shot of the children when they went down the steps out of the school. I said, there was none. I said, oh, there must have been, there must have been. So it was, so it was making the audience carry the thing yeah. in their mind, you see. In terms of the traditional sort of old time Griffith cut cross cutting, uh, I think the chase you did in uh, number 17, is, it still holds up superbly. Um, perhaps yeah. because it's, it's mainly miniature, and I guess you had the chance to yes, play flat it. Yes, it was all made in minutes. Those fantastic yeah. travelling shots of the car going under the bridge and the train moving forward at the same yes. time. Yes. incredible. Yes, that was done by... You, you saw on the screen the rails and the roadway and both train and um, Greyhound bus are coming mm. toward you. Green line bus, please. Green line bus, yes. I was thinking about an American <laughs> audience, you know. And uh, they both come toward you and suddenly you see the bus go across the front of the train, or what do you think? And the camera whips yeah. back, and the train goes under a bridge, and the bus goes over the bridge. What made you finally make the move to Hollywood? Because you always wanted to be the big Hollywood director, or because you'd done as much as you could in British film in that time? Well, I was the number one British director, but on the other hand, I noticed that um, Hollywood was... Uh, there was uh, directors from all over Europe going there. So in a way, it was a challenge actually, because there were no other British directors there, yes. except James Whale, I think, was the only one, but then he came from the theatre, you mm -hmm. see. Did you sort of have the uh, outsized size of films like Rebecca and Foreign Correspondent imposed on you, or did you intend to make them that, that big and pretentious? Well, the first picture intended was to be the Titanic, mm -hmm. and I researched that considerably. In fact, the, the producer intended at the time uh, to buy the Leviathan, which was awaiting the shipbreaker's um, 
offer, and uh, he was going to have it towed round through the canal mm -hmm. and sink it off Santa Monica, which was a prodigious job. I often think, you know, he would say, well, gone there it is, make the most of it. What do you do, you know? Do a close-up of a riveting dolly back. <laughs> or uh, put eight cameras on it and then the ship is sunk. And a white-faced electrician says, the electricity wasn't on. No camera got it. <laughs> and it's kind of a derivation, perhaps, from that wonderful climactic dolly shot in Young and Innocent, which oh, is yes, the most uh, elaborate shot you've ever done. It is, yes. That was, uh, well, there again, you see. Uh, it was, it, it arose from the dialogue statement of an old man says to a young girl, he said, isn't it ridiculous sitting here among all these people looking for a man whose eyes blink? Have you often felt that individual films of yours would be, would, would be improved by your going back to them and working on them? Uh, I don't think I would care to do that. In fact, I'll go further. I wished I didn't have to make them. <laughs> You see, having worked with the writer on the design of the film, the, really the whole creative work is finished. All you have now is to wait and see it diminish mm -hmm. and find you only arrive with 60% of the original conception on the screen. Have you ever thought of working as Lubitsch did occasionally by preparing the film yourself, a film like Desire or Royal, Royal Scandal, literally making the film yourself on paper on the storyboard? and then handing it over to another uh, director like Otto Preminger just to carry out order no, for you. No, we wouldn't want to do that. No. That so so there, is some the... fun, there is some fun for you in physically making it. Well, there's some fun and, and, and the need to get it right. I mean, uh, uh, you know, there's tempo involved, mm -hmm. the size of image. Of course, storyboard will take care of that, providing that the other director adhered to the storyboard. Mm -hmm. This may not be of uh, much concerned you commercially since your films are always shown you know theaters and tv and make a lot of money still for you i'm sure but it's uh, i don't think there's any one director whose films are used more in film schools to teach film technique you can literally build a whole course around hitchcock films whereas with the obvious people like eisenstein and griffith i think with one or two films you've done it but i do know of um, you know, whole courses have been built just around your films and the students learn a tremendous amount from them well, and that, they're entertained at the same time. Yes, but the, more, the most important thing is that I am a Puritan and I am a believer in the visual. And that's what I think that schools should teach. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so often you hear of schools who send a pupil out with an 8 millimeter camera and see what he comes back with, mm -hmm. you know, how he, he observes. Well, that's only a part of the, of the whole process. That's like being in an art school and when you're sent out to sketch people sitting at a railroad terminal, mm -hmm. uh, that's the whole course, which it isn't at all. It's only a little tiny segment of the course. And I think that uh, film schools should teach the history as much as anything mm -hmm. from the beginning. Well, it's interesting. Most of the first-year students come back with films that look like Ingmar Bergman films. But by the second year, when they've really absorbed technique and style and history, they come back with Hitchcock films. Yes. which is rather nice, I think. Yes, it is.